All right, our next presenter is Peter Fettelman uh, from Blue Origin, and he'll be talking to us uh, about uh, an outsider's perspective on CFS. Peter. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, before we start off, uh, just want to check that you can see me and hear me. Yes, we can see you, we can hear you. Thanks. Excellent. Um, well, uh, as you just heard a moment ago, uh, I'm Peter Fiddleman. I'm going to talk about CFS. Uh, without further ado, next slide, please. And next slide. Thank you. So as most of you already know, CFS is a commonly used avionics software framework. Uh, it's been used on a lot of missions, past, present, and future. Um, I have not used CFS very much because uh, Blue Origin has our own frameworks that we use internally. And in some ways, they're similar to CFS, and in other ways, they're different. So when I look at CFS, I sort of think, wow, CFS is really, really good at some things, and it also has some interesting weaknesses. Uh, this talk will be about my perception of those strengths and weaknesses. Uh, my goal is hopefully to capture what CFS looks like to an outsider, what it does well, and what perhaps can be improved. Next slide, please. So I, I have to start with a disclaimer here. Uh, as I said, I'm pretty inexperienced with CFS. So occasionally I will say it has a weakness or it could be improved in a certain way. I might be wrong. It might be my, my inexperienced talking. And uh, many people at this conference are the, the experts who would probably know outright the answers to these things. So if anyone would like to correct me or perhaps add suggestions, I would love to talk after this presentation, perhaps in the conference Slack about uh, ab about some of these things. Uh, moving on, uh, next slide, please. Um, so starting off, uh, what is CFS really good at? Um, well, first off, it's it's open source and very collaborative. There's a large ecosystem of applications that can be reused between missions, which is very cool. Also, the framework itself is portable between a range of operating systems that are frequently used in space. And also, and crucially uh, for future avionics systems, CFS has good multiprocessor support. Um, so it will be able to fully utilize multi-core platforms. All of these things are, are very good. But if I just talked about the good things, this wouldn't be a very interesting talk. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to talk about is application performance monitoring. And what I mean by this is how can you tell that applications are running with the timing that you expect? Things like this become important if your systems have any kind of real-time constraint. Beyond that, it's also uh, nice to have this sort of monitoring because it means that you can easily keep tabs on your system performance during development. And you will notice right away are each of my changes making the system faster or slower? Next slide, please. Um, so where CFS is today, it is possible to do some of this. The first thing to mention is the task execution counter that is maintained by executive services. This tracks passes through the application main loop. Um, Another feature is the performance log that is maintained by uh, executive services. Uh, this lets you place markers in the application and it will track the the times at which those those are hit uh, a disadvantage being you do have to instrument your your code with those markers for, for this to work there isn't a standard place where the markers are set um, another feature uh, is provided by the health and safety application which allows you to monitor any counter uh, such as the task execution counter um, that your application maintains. Uh, health and safety also does CPU utilization monitoring of its own via a low priority background task, but this just gives a one number for the overall uh, free time. It isn't broken down per application, say. Um, if you want more detailed information, uh, one final possibility is to collect this information yourself and put it in the housekeeping telemetry message that your application publishes. This is a good fallback, but it must be implemented by each application. So everyone would decide what information is important themselves. So it might not be very consistent. Next slide, please. Um, so my question or suggestion 
is what if CFS itself collected more detailed performance information itself? That would save individual applications a lot of work in terms of uh, deciding what to instrument themselves. Um, so some suggestions might be, uh, one, one possibility, executive services is in a good position to monitor the main loop runtime of, of each CFS application and might even be able to provide some simple statistics like uh, min, max, mean, or something of, of that sort. Um, Another possibility, which is even more interesting to me, is for systems that are using the scheduler, uh, that already has an idea of when each application should be running because it's, it's triggering them. Um, so uh, it might be a good fit for the scheduler to also keep tabs on the applications and report whether each one has completed its work at the expected time, and if not, when, and how much margin wound up being left. Um, monitoring features such as this are potentially very useful, especially if something in your system starts uh, taking more time than you're expecting. It gives you a, a good way to figure out what or what application is affected at least. Um, next slide, please. Um, so a very related concept is the idea of a deadline or an execution time bound. Um, so something like this might be triggered if a application was still running at a certain time, having not completed its work. It is a very similar idea to a watchdog, except the response is typically a bit more configurable and perhaps less drastic than rebooting the entire system. Um, the reason that uh, deadlines are important is they not only do they give you visibility into whether applications are running long, but they also give you the opportunity to adapt your system behavior uh, in perhaps application specific ways, which is potentially useful depending on if there is a, a good path for your system to recover from such a problem. Uh, next slide, please. So where CFS is today, we have some ability in, in CFS to do uh, things like this. Um, the one that came to mind when I started looking into it was, again, using the health and safety counter monitoring feature and looking at the task execution counter for the tasks that you, you care about. Um, the problems I see with that are, uh, monitoring the counters will only take effect after an application has run very long or been stuck for, for a long time, like multiple cycles. Um, another thing is it seems like this is only going to monitor the counter for liveness, like is it changing or incrementing at all, and not necessarily comparing against the expected execution rate of, of your task. Um, also, there are APIs for directly like messing with this counter, so it isn't necessarily going to 100% reliably detect whether the application is in, indeed running on, on time or not. Um, next slide, please. So one possibility or, or suggestion here is, again, this seems to me like a, a good opportunity for something that perhaps the scheduler could do differently because it already has a idea of when tasks should be running. It might be a good opportunity to extend the scheduler by also telling it when each application is uh, expected to finish or giving it a deadline, and then it can detect whether the application has finished and if not, report it at that time, perhaps via firing an event, which um, applications can then respond to however they want. Um, for this to work, however, we would need to define what does done executing mean. And I'm not, I'm not widely familiar enough with CFS applications to know the best way of doing that, perhaps checking if it has made it back into the run loop, perhaps looking for a specific message from the application. I'm not sure. It's interesting to think about though. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to a different topic, um, spacecraft avionics, especially nowadays, are often a distributed system. Distributed CFS systems communicate by sending and receiving messages, where each message is a structure typically framed by hand and assigned a message ID. Messages tend to contain many variables, and even if you only care about a particular variable, 
typically you need to su subscribe to the entire message. And this is something of a waste of bandwidth. Uh, if you see in this diagram here, we have one message containing five variables, A, B, C, D, E. All of these other flight computers care about one variable in the message, but they are going to need to subscribe to the whole message. Next slide, please. So if you wanted to not transmit so much data around the internal networks of, of your, your spacecraft, you would probably go in and uh, reframe these messages, uh, splitting them up so that only the necessary data is sent to each machine. Um, today, this kind of reframing is usually not automatic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, getting a little bit more into detail, uh, if multiple CFS computers need to communicate today, it's likely they will use one of the applications on this slide. Um, the software bus network application is the most notable. It extends the pub sub uh, message passing of, of CFS to work over a local communication bus, which, which is very cool. Uh, it seems to work without very much effort. However, the messages are sent as is, uh, meaning that it's not like message IDs are really like the messages are not split up or changed. Um, I've also seen or heard there could be scalability problems with uh, the message IDs. However, this seems to be addressed with newer versions of CFS. Worth mentioning, though. Um, other applications are uh, also possible to use, like you could use command ingest or telemetry output. Uh, and these are cool because they, they do let you reframe the message a bit more uh, and give you tight control over the framing. Um, so it's useful for places where a rigid uh, message ICD is really needed, like across a, a vehicle to ground interface. However, this doesn't really help with the whole automatic part of the message reframing. It's, it's just going to do what you manually told it to do. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, so there's a, a few possible ways of, of dealing with this. The most uh, obvious way is to make the whole manual message reframing process easier by creating tools to help with the message management. Um, because today to change a message, it's a, a little annoying. You have to change the struct definitions and also the code that packs and unpacks the messages. And then at a higher level, you need to make sure all producers and consumers of a message are agreeing on its definition. Um, these all seem like things that tooling could help with. Um, one that I've seen that, that seems pretty handy is the command and data dictionary CCDD um, tool that uh, can be used as a single source, source of truth for message contents. Um, unfortunately, uh, even if you have a single source of truth like this, it does, does not really seem to help you uh, make the code changes to CFS applications in, unless perhaps you came up with some kind of code generator based on CCDD. Um, next slide, please. Another possibility, which is a much more radical change, is to consider getting away from the idea of the rigid software bus messages to begin with, and instead think of the individual uh, variables that need to get shared between flight computers. And by variable, I mean like the constituent values within one of those structures. Um, uh, if you think of producer consuming consumer router routing, producer-consumer routing of the individual variables, uh, then you can uh, think of which uh, variables are produced where, consumed where, and then think as an optimization step of batching them into larger messages. In fact, this is a vehicle-wide optimization problem with the goal of minimizing like a, a bandwidth score. Um, this could be done offline in a tool that would help you frame your messages, or it could even be done at at runtime, because it's it's worth mentioning there are plenty of existing technologies out there that try to solve the problem of uh, efficiently routing a lot of variables to a lot of different places. Like uh, I've got some listed on the slide that I haven't looked at in great detail, but the idea of a distributed key value store might be interesting. However, it would also be a, a huge departure from how CFS does message handling right now, and such flexibility probably wouldn't be needed on all missions. I just put it out there as a idea for cross-pollination that some people might find interesting. Next slide, please. 
Um, so related topic, going back to software bus for a moment, another related question is uh, what is the best way of interacting with the software bus messages to begin with? As mentioned previously, each message will contain multiple variables. Uh, and we need a way of defining which variables are expected to be packed into each message. And then we need a way to access each of those uh, variables from the flight software. And this packing needs to bear in mind uh, flight uh, computer specific things that might be different on different hosts, like the endianness and, and padding. This is especially important if you're making a more heterogeneous system that uses different uh, processing architectures or something. Um, Next slide, please. So the way that this is done uh, today for Software Bus seems to be creating nested structs. And in the examples that I looked at and the simple applications that I wrote, this was done manually. So you would have nested uh, structs. Uh, for instance, one uh, containing header format, then the next one has a, a payload. Um, and you can see there's things like there's there's padding in here and you need to make sure that, that packing is enabled and used consistently. And you also need to make sure that all producers and consumers of the message agree, not just on the contents, but also on details like this. Um, also, there is not necessarily sanity checking that you got the framing wrong. So uh, not just did you swap the order of fields or something, but even gross errors like the thing that I received is completely the wrong size are not necessarily going to be detected today anyway. Next slide, please. Um, so there are various ways of addressing this because it turns out that serializing and deserializing things are a very common problem and people have made tools to help with this. Um, one possibility would be using a binary description language like Kaitai struct. And there was a very good and interesting talk at last year's flight software workshop that was talking about using Kaitai to deserialize messages received from a CFS system, if I remember correctly. Um, so Kaitai is very interesting. Unfortunately, in its present state, at least, it is read-only. Uh, you can deserialize things, but you can't round trip and subsequently serialize a, a, a message. Uh, there are plans to fix this in Kaitai, but it doesn't seem to be the highest priority ticket, and it still hasn't been uh, added. Um, so if you don't use Kaitai, it's also possible to use a uh, uh, pre-made data interchange format, especially if you have control over both ends of the communication link. The canonical example of something like this is, is Google Protobuf. However, that isn't necessarily the most suited for spaceflight for various reasons. Uh, there are other possibilities out there, uh, like Captain Proto is one. There's also ASN1, which is uh, widely used outside of spaceflight as well and gives pretty fine control over what you want the wire format to look like. Um, ultimately, what tool is used is not the most important thing. I just want to point out there are plenty of tools out there that will generate message encoders and decoders for you in pretty much whatever language you want. And it, it can be easier to do something like this than writing it by hand. Some of them will also make validity checkers for you that you can use to sanity check messages before you try uh, cracking them into their individual fields. So. Good, good tooling is, is out there and may or may not help you depending on your, your mission. Next slide, please. Um, okay, and that brings us to the uh, perennially exciting topic of uh, configuration. Um, so system configuration can happen at, at different times, at, like different degrees of flexibility. Some things can be reconfigured at runtime, generally speaking. Uh, some things can be configured at startup time. Some things can be configured at compile time. So you have a progression of like locking things down more and, and more. Um, so if there are parameters that will never change, that you know will never change, uh, sometimes it can be in a mission's best interest to lock them down so that they cannot be changed. This can reduce the state space necessary to explore when you are verifying systems. Uh, for example. However, especially for long duration missions, there is the counter argument that if you reduce this flexibility too much, 
you will be a unable to work around failures, especially failures that you can't uh, anticipate beforehand. So there's sort of a trade-off here between short mission durations that might want to be very locked down and verifiable, and long missions, especially long robotic missions, where you want to be able to change anything at a human's discretion. Next slide, please. Um, so the design of a framework like CFS will influence what kind of things have to be configured at compile time and what kinds of things can be configured at, at startup time or runtime. And some examples from CFS is the, the message framing, which as we saw earlier was controlled by C structs, that is static. Like those structs are compiled in, you're not going to change them. So that's an example of something that's compile time configured. Um, some startup time configured things are like the startup script that runs when you boot your, your CFS uh, software. Um, also, sometimes there's dynamic memory allocation when you load applications, acquire resources, and so forth. Um, then at, at runtime, many, uh, many components are configured through tables like the scheduler takes a table, many other things take tables. Um, the trade-off of configuring these things at uh, startup time or runtime is that now they might fail and they might fail during a mission and you need workarounds for that and, and so forth. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I guess uh, suggestions here are, you can't have a one size fits all solution for all possible missions. The only thing you can really do is make the framework as flexible as possible. And one thing that I think would be interesting to see would be uh, modification of applications to make them easier to statically configure um, with uh, hard coded config files, perhaps. You can hard code them or you can generate them, which is another interesting thing. Uh, generated code can also be uh, sanity checked or otherwise have its integrity verified by the compiler through things like static asserts, which are traditionally a C++ feature, but they are in modern versions of C now. Um, CFS is already actually doing some things kind of like this with the uh, preprocessor if and error directives to check constants in some of those uh, verified.h files. Um, and there are, of course, languages other than, than C that have more powerful uh, compile time um, checking that they can do, but that would be another very big change. Anyway, the reason I'm harping on this so much is that having static configuration and like more statically acquired resources in general would make CFS easier to port to smaller and less capable computers like microcontroller class. Uh, I've heard of people doing that already. For example, last year's flight software workshop had a talk by someone who was running CFS on top of FreeRTOS and uh, talked about his, his journey to get that working. As far as I know, however, this sort of thing tends to be done more by individuals rather than being a configuration that is supported in mainline CFS. Um, so it, it would be interesting to see more, more mainline support of that and maybe see those configurations more used. It would probably expand the usability of this framework onto a wider range of missions. Um, next slide, please. All right, um, so in, in conclusion, I've spent the last 20 minutes talking about where I think CFS could improve. Um, I don't want it to get lost. I think that there are a lot of very good things about CFS already that should not be ignored, which I've already talked about. Um, however, uh, good things can always be made better. And my hope would be that this presentation just sort of gets uh, everyone listening, thinking about incremental changes that would make uh, the framework just a little bit better and more widely useful. Thank you. And uh, next slide should just be a question slide. Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, great presentation. And I also forgot to mention at the beginning of this that we have, we created a QEMU channel. And we also created a CFS channel. So some of these things can go over there. We uh, Let's see how far we can get for with respect to questions. Um, so Rack asked, uh, have you looked at the EDS recently uh, added to CC, CCSDS? I know a lot of work has been done, uh, been going on to use this, the EDS to solve some of the issues you mentioned. Um, that is a good thing to point out. Uh, I do not believe I've looked at it, or if I have, I don't uh, remember it. So I will take another look. Thanks for the suggestion. All right. And um, 
from Will. Uh, can you give some specifics on issues you mentioned uh, with using protocol buffers for message serialization? Um, well, uh, I haven't personally uh, used them, or if, if so, it would have been a long time. I remember issues involving uh, dynamic memory allocation that were hard to track down. And also, they're just a fairly complicated thing in general with uh, the, the code generation step. Uh, there's a lot of things that can break there. So simpler tools are better if possible, but sorry, I can't be more specific. All right, great. And there's one other question that we will bring over to the Slack CFS channel. And uh, I encourage uh, Peter and other folks who are interested in CFS to hop over there and continue the conversation. Thanks a lot, Peter. Excellent presentation. Cool. Thank you. All right.